Poland is about to co-host the 2012 European Football Championships. But inside the country there are concerns that it's not really ready for promotion into Travel's big league. On this Fast Track special, I'll be travelling across the country to put its tourist credentials to the test. On my journey, I'll be discovering Krakow's new forward-looking Jewish community, finding out how modern Warsaw is still dealing with its past and heading deep into Europe's last primeval forest. Why we sometimes use this word primeval? Because it sounds better. <laughs> it's a better advertisement. Join me as I explore a country still traumatised by its past, but looking forward to a brighter future. In recent years, Poland has become noted for exporting its people to the rest of the world. Now it wants more people from the rest of the world to come over to its place. Later, I'll be heading up to the current capital, Warsaw, and then on to Poland's eastern border with Belarus to find my inner beast in the heart of the wild forest. But I begin in the cultural capital, in the south of the country. The Old Market Square in Krakow, probably Poland's most historically rich and picturesque city. In a few weeks' time, this place will be crammed full of football fans, pumped up for Euro 2012. But that's just a launch pad for a new drive to woo the likes of you and me over, starting with a very specific kind of visitor. But I think a lot of the change and the revitalization of this area, Kazimierz, is uh, it very much has to do with Schindler's List. I remember people would tell me even about 15 years ago that when you came here, there was one cafe. There was really one pub, cafe. It was very much a bad place to live. Kazimierz, now the cool, funky district of Krakow, was once home to a flourishing Jewish community. In the 1930s, they made up a quarter of Krakow's population. This part of the country will be forever inextricably linked with the horrors of the concentration camps and gas chambers, where 90% of Poland's Jews were murdered during World War II. Auschwitz, Treblinka and Oskar Schindler's factory are all nearby and on the tourist trail. But Jonathan feels if they only visit these sites, people get a skewed image. There's a diff very difficult history here and I think that we need to study that and learn about it, but I think that we, you know, we should study the past but we shouldn't drown in the past and we shouldn't drown in the history. And you know, life moves on and there you have, we have a community here where a lot of Holocaust survivors and they're not sitting around only thinking about the past, so why should we? Jewish people have been visiting here for some time. Many still see it as a spiritual home. This is uh, Shiroka Street, which is the main square of uh, Kazimierz. A few years back, Jonathan would have scorned buggy rides and themed restaurants for cashing in on the Holocaust Trail. Jurassic Park, as he puts it. Now, let's just stop one second. You were talking about these Jewish themed mm -hmm. places. This is one, is that right? Yes. Uh, the menu, is it... Uh, is it authentic? Is it kosher? Um, <laughs> kosher, no. Authentic, no. Um, but I, uh, but interesting. There are certain things which uh, pass over cheese. There are certain things which I, I, I have no idea really what they are, but they, <laughs> but they definitely sound Jewish. Turns out Passover cheese is cheesecake. Today, Jonathan regards all this as an affirmation of the pulling power of Jewish culture, almost a backhanded compliment. Come on! Come on! Shake it, Krakow! Now younger people are being drawn towards traditional Jewish arts. Krakow now hosts the biggest Jewish festival in Europe, started in the late 80s by two non-Jews. And the traditional themes of klezmer music still resonate today with new artists. 
It's uh, about life, about uh, people's happiness and sadness and, and worries. The song describes the normal life, the, the problems of the family, of death, of, of uh, wedding, everything. It's the instantly recognisable rhythms of klezmer I particularly identify with. Surely anyone can play that? One, two, three, four. Right. <laughs> I'm getting it wrong. I'm getting it wrong. That's right. Ooh, it sounds horrible. Uh, no. Yeah, right. Someone's deliberately sabotaged the strings. Yeah. I've got an idea. Can you tune the, the bass for me? Well, okay. Maybe it's a bit more complicated <laughs> than I thought. Listen, it's the first time I played this stuff, and these guys went to music academy. I'm not supposed to film this bit. <laughs> <laughs> Early next morning and its destination, Warsaw. Funny, just how I imagined, though not necessarily hoped, a Polish railway station would be like. Poland receives more European Union money than any other country to improve its transport system. Poland's Achilles heel is probably its infrastructure. Poor communications, bad roads, slow trains, which veer from national joke to national tragedy. On the plus side, though, trains are kind of charming and cheap. The three-hour journey from Pakhov to Warsaw, only $12. There was a lot of criticism about the neglected state of some of the tracks after a recent fatal crash on this line but it's still seen as a faster, safer way of getting around than cars, of which more later. Warsaw, the capital and a city of contrasts. The shadow of Stalinist control looms large here, gradually being crowded out by gleaming new skyscrapers. Commercialisation in the shape of global brands and designer goods have swept through Warsaw and Poland over the last few years. But there are vestiges of the old Eastern Bloc that many Poles will be sad to see go. They're called bare mesni, milk bars, and they may or may not have milk. It's a bit of a misnomer. So I've got to choose something from this menu. You can have dairy products, or you can have fish, you can have a zoop. A zoop? Yeah, if you prefer. Oh, uh, zoop is zoop. Zoop, zoop, zoop. Yeah. Like <laughs> and maybe some fish with potatoes? Yeah, but you can also get go fish with some buckwheat, for example, if you like buckwheat. These old fashioned canteens date back more than a century, but were adopted and subsidised by the communist regime to provide affordable food for the poor, pensioners, and students. The, the mushroom soup and the dumplings. So that's 8.93, which is really cheap, isn't it? In dollars, that's about three dollars maximum. Looks delicious. Now that is very nice. It's very tasty. It's lovely. <laughs> But it seems the days of the milk bar are numbered. Government funding's been slashed, and that's prompted sit-ins and demonstrations. Recently, there has been a very popular milk bar closed, and people organized themselves to bring it back. In this city, in this area, there are a lot of poor families that can, cannot afford anything else than eating out in the milk bar, because there is, there is a part of the milk bar that are only expensive and exclusive restaurants. The Polish economy may be growing, but the average wage here is still half the European average, and unemployment is high. 
you don't buy a dress if you cannot afford to buy food. So people that live here have other demands and this all touristical impact and all this investment in tourism are not really representing the needs of people that live here. So don't ditch the baby with the bathwater seems to be the message I'm getting so far in that dash to enter the brave new world of free market capitalism. And as we'll find out in part two, to get a real feel for the country, it might be a case of mix and match, from fashion to forestry. We try to be like Berlin, like Paris, like London. I don't know if we are, but we are trying. We've seen how the transition from communism to Western-style capitalism has thrown up problems still apparent to visitors to Poland today. But fact is, many younger people in the capital Warsaw embrace the new era. And this new ambitious go-getting spirit is driving creative industries like fashion and media. There's a new work-hard, play-hard mentality now amongst the Varashka, the cool Warsaw crowd. Very different to previous generations. Young people uh, are much more open, they have better personality than their parents, yes, because they know that personality is the, the best thing to get a job, to make a connection, to pick up somebody, yes. This is a busy bee, gym crazy, globe trotting, bistro loving, wine quaffing crowd. But even Paulina admits there are still some bumps in the road to straighten out. Literally. We have uh, some kinds of problems, for example, with road. It is a problem, and I'm a driver, and uh, sometimes uh, everything makes me crazy. <laughs> yes. This is not a unique attitude. Virtually every pole I talk to mentioned it. I think the infrastructure probably needs a bit more, uh, there's a bit of work to be done on the infrastructure in terms of roads. Poland could be ready for mass tourism if there would be better public transport, better uh, infrastructure. <laughs> European Union money, and lots of it, is being spent trying to upgrade the road network. But progress has been plagued by delays and interruptions. The vital and much heralded new high-speed multi-lane artery between Berlin and Warsaw, for instance, will not be complete in time for Euro 2012. But are you worried that when the focus is on Poland, for the European Football Championships and people talk about there being a not very good uh, transport network in Poland, that suddenly there'll be a lot of pressure on you? That, are you not worried about how Poland will look to the rest of the world? We feel it and, and uh, we are trying to face it and um, to prepare this transport system uh, as good as we can and uh, as good as is possible. Basically, in spite of those huge EU grants, there are still too many single-lane highways with lorries going backwards and forwards from the Baltic, clogging up the system. We've been behind the same lorry now for 20 minutes. 
Oh, and Poland has the dubious honor of having the highest road fatality rate in Europe. You can see that this is it's decreasing, but we hope that for next um, five years uh, we can we can face the, 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 um, the, the this trend that, that, that it, it will be decreasing. So when we eventually get there, we'll be in the east of this vast country. Someone once said building the state of Poland between the huge monoliths of Germany and Russia was like setting up a tent on a highway. My answer right now would be, well, let's just build the highway first. There's some prime woodland in these parts. Lumber mills are busy. But where we're heading is protected. A World Heritage Site, in fact. So here I am on the eastern border of Poland. Belarus is just over there, in the last primeval virginal forest left in Europe. 1,500 square kilometers of it. Five hundred bison are roaming free throughout the forest, saved from extinction and being carefully bred in special enclosures. But it's the huge range of birds that are a delight to this rather unique park ranger. Right now we can hear a uh, natach, we can hear a uh, uh, chaffinch, uh, there's wood pigeon calling, um, further there are some woodpeckers drumming. This is daytime. This is a spring coming. Matiusz has dreamed of being a ranger since he was a kid. He studied forestry at high school and then at university. His father was a forestry teacher and a guide for 50 years. Yet even today, Matiusz is still in wonder every time he roams out into the national park. I spot a, a pack of wolves which was hunting for the deers. Uh, but also there are some less spectacular things like I found, uh, I met a moose. Uh, yeah, I met him <laughs> just first time uh, here in this part of the forest. There are 24 species of tree here, the oldest being 600 years. The nature can decide what will survive and where. But Matush believes mankind should take a strictly hands-off approach, and he's not the only one. The rules state that tourists aren't even allowed to enter this part without an official guide. In the national park, not to protect here any trees or species. Maybe we more care about the European bison. But our goal is to protect the uh, process, the natural process. But this isn't the end of my Iron John adventure. After all, we are in the land that claims it invented vodka. Uh -huh. So, here you can taste the bison. This is bison vodka? Yes. Made with bison? My, made <laughs> with uh, bison grass. I can just sip it, yeah? Um, just say na zdrowie. <laughs> and that means in and, one, yeah? And drink it in one. one. Okay, here we go. Na zdrowie. Na zdrowie. Ah, it does have an interesting taste. Yes. Do you connect with, with the nature around you in some way, do you think? I just feel much better when I see uh, something green and uh, that something is moving, the wind, it's uh, saying something to my ears. In Poland, <laughs> you always say, you cannot drink just for one leg. You have to drink at least a second. For two legs to make you legless. Yes. Right. Nice little. Tak, tak, 
So, sore head and all, I'm reaching the end of my journey through the heart of Poland. This is Pentovo, one of a handful of so-called European white stork villages in this part of the world. Right now, they're just completing their long journey home from Africa. 40,000 couples and a few footloose singles to boot. But is, I wonder, this country ready for an influx of tourists? Poles are very warm, hospitable people. They're very excited that the country will be, there will be so much focus on, on Poland during the tournament. And I think that most people see it as a very, very good thing and a bit of a showcase for Poland. But the infrastructure, there is a way to go in terms of if you've traveled a bit on Polish roads, you see it's not the, not the best situation. Of course I would like to be these streets full of tourists, but I would rather like all these people, to all people that live in Warsaw, to live in safety and secure of their houses. It's difficult to uh, make something the best uh, after 20 years of the communism, yes. We were a communist country, but right now we are developing pretty fast, but still we have beautiful nature, beautiful cities. Um, also, what uh, people can see that um, ladies are beautiful. It's reckoned that about 50% of the Poles who left the country after it joined the European Union have now returned to the nest. But it's tourists they really want flocking over here, and well after the fanfare of Euro 2012 has died down. But where should they go? Well, I would suggest in search of Poland's secrets, its wildlife, its lakes, its revived Jewish community, rather than going hunting for global brands in the city centres. Because ultimately, this proud reserve nation is a warm host, ready to reconcile the past and look to the future and welcome a new benign invasion, the likes of you and me. But before I go, there's just something else I've got to do. Thank you. <laughs>